Thank you for joining our presentation tonight. Uh, my name is Stacy. I am going to be your webinar host this evening. I'm so excited to be here with you. Thank you for joining us for Preserving the Human-Animal Bond, a holistic approach to fear, anxiety, and stress. Tonight's presentation is being brought to you by our friends at Covetris Personalized Care Pharmacies. And presenting tonight will be our very own Dr. Jennifer Merlo. So Dr. Merlo is currently Fear Free's Director of Veterinary Affairs, but she began her career in vet med in 2004 after graduating from The Ohio State University with her DVM. And while she initially focused on equine medicine, she uh, soon switched over and began specializing in small animal general practice. She then uh, moved to North Carolina and has been a supporter of Fear Free since its inception. She's an elite certified Fear Free professional. She owned the first Fear Free certified practice in North Carolina and helped to spread the Fear Free movement amongst general practice and emergency and critical care practices across North and South Carolina before she joined us here on the Fear Free team in 2021. And what a blessing it's been for her to be here with us. So we are so excited to have everybody joining us here this evening. Dr. Merlo, we're so excited to have you with us. So on that note, I will pass it over to you and we can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Stacey. I'm really excited to be here um, and sharing this evening with everyone. Um, I will um, openly admit um, I uh, am very comfortable with public speaking, but when I was looking at the number of registrants for tonight and keeping my husband informed who hates public speaking um, and told him how many people might be attending tonight. Um, he gave me a word of advice, which was just unplug my laptop and say good night um, and no longer give this presentation. But we are going to carry on. Um, good, thankfully for you all, I am presenting and he is not. Um, so um, I want to say thank you to our partners um, and friends at Covetris Personalized Care Pharmacies for having me this evening. Um, again, very excited to be speaking with you. All right. So Stacy gave a great introduction about everything that I've done in my background. I'm very honored to be a part of the Fear Free team. Um, and truly at the heart of everything we do at Fear Free, it's the desire to preserve, elevate, and enhance the human-animal bond. I'm really excited to spend the next little bit of time with you as we discuss the history of the human animal bond, as well as how fear free education combined with advances in medication administration and formulation can really help that relationship between pets and pet owners. The bond between humans and animals is different than the relationship that we have with anything else or even each other. The human-animal bond is defined as a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals that's influenced by behaviors essential to the health and well-being of both. And it includes a number of things, including emotional, psychological, and physical interactions of people, animals, and the environment. We're all in this industry because we love animals and we love the effect they have on the people that care for them. And we've all become witness to this human animal bond. According to research done by Bayer, the human animal bond has evolved for over 15,000 years. That's incredible to me. The human animal bond that we see today truly began as a working relationship between animals and humans one in which animals provided both protection and service to their caretakers. So we saw things starting with utilizing dogs for herding, utilizing them for tracking and protection. Cats were utilized and kept outdoors to hunt and kill rodents to prevent the spread of disease or damage to food supplies. And this was just the beginning of that bond that we see today. The Smithsonian has reported that dogs were the first domesticated animals. Ancient Romans were known to keep toy dogs and European royalty even had garments designed with special pockets so that they could carry around small dogs with them. I love that as an owner of a smaller breed dog now, if I had something where I could put him in a pocket and carry him around with me, that would be fantastic. Cats were kept by ancient Egyptians as pets. And when a cat 
died, the owner would actually shave their eyebrows to signify the loss to other members of the community. This is how bonded they were to their pet. We know that over 12,000 years ago, cats and dogs were actually buried alongside their human caretakers. And that just better supports that idea that humans and pets were truly bonded to each other even then. We've seen ancient art that showcases animals further showing that importance of the bond. There was a study done recently by Zoetis and the Human Animal Bond Research Institute that showed that this bond between pet owners and pets remains strong and that pets positively impact their owner's health. Almost 100% of pet owners surveyed considered pets as a part of their family. 98% of them felt they had experienced health benefits from having a pet in their life. The bond between humans and animals can take many different forms. The one that we are most familiar with is pet ownership. We see that with every pet that we come in contact with. People choose to share their lives with a companion animal. Oftentimes, these are dogs or cats or small furry creatures. Pet owners interact with their pets in an informal way and they gain joy through that companionship. We, have, we know that people bond with assistance animals. Those who have disabilities or chronic illnesses have the use of carefully trained and selected pets that assist them in life. And then we have the bond with working animals. According to the United States Army Medical Department Journal, cavalry horses, sentry dogs, carrier pigeons, and even mascots were all common roles that animals played in the workforce. They were not only providing a service and protection, but also offered stress relief and a sense of pride for their human counterparts and those taking care of them. We're all aware that studies have shown that mental health benefits can come from pets. In today's world, doctors are actually prescribing pets for mental illness and wellness. Teachers are using pets in classroom activities and therapy dogs and cats are utilized to help bring joy to those who are facing chronic illness. Workplaces are becoming more pet friendly to help reduce stress for their employees. A recent study conducted by Nationwide in partnership with the Human Animal Bond Research Institute revealed that 90% of employees in a pet friendly workplace actually felt more connected to their company's mission if they were allowed to bring their pet to work. They were more engaged in their work and more willing to recommend that employer to others. I'm lucky I work from home, so I work in a naturally pet-friendly environment, but I know that before that, obviously working in the veterinary field, most of us worked in pet-friendly places, but I can't imagine not being able to bring my pet to work with me. It's just something that's been ingrained in me since I've been working. So I love the fact that more and more employers are embracing this because it does bring such joy to their employees. When we look at employees that work in non-pet friendly workplaces, only 65% of them are engaged and willing to recommend their employers. What an impact pets have on our emotional health and well-being. Over three times as many employees report a positive working relationship with their boss and their coworkers if they work in a pet-friendly environment. Results of this study suggest that pet owners are becoming more knowledgeable of the human-animal bond and the effect it has on them. And that bond helps them form bonds with other people at work. Interestingly, these pet owners that have become more knowledgeable of the, the human-animal bond are also more likely to become closely attached to their veterinary professionals and the veterinary support staff compared to those animals who are not as, or those pet owners who are not as aware. And that's what we all want as veterinary professionals. We want that close attachment with the pet owners and building that relationship. The human animal bond though is not limited to companion animals. We often think of that 
because we think of cuddly and furry and things that we can cuddle up on our bed with. But humans become bonded to all species. This can include birds. It can include pocket pets, reptiles, food animals, and equines. While we often take the form of dogs and cats curled up on your bed to mean that human animal bond, it can look like a friendly police horse, or it can look like a gecko, or even a snake within your home that provides companionship and joy. I will say I have always been uh, one that loves cuddly and furry and something I can pet and hold close to. Um, I'm a horse girl at heart. I grew up around horses and they were my first uh, bond to an animal, but certainly I love my dogs and cats as well. I recently became the owner of three chickens um, in the last year and I am so bonded to these birds that it truly demonstrated to me the power of the human animal bond. I love going out and seeing my chickens every day and they bring me joy in a way that my dog and cats don't. Um, so it truly does expand across all sorts of species. As we see the bond between animals and their owners evolve, we're seeing changes within the level of care desired by pet owners. We've seen trends in human medicine crossing over to veterinary medicine, and that includes areas like pain management, complementary and innovative therapy, and an enhanced appreciation for the quality of life of our pets. Truly pain management has become very central to veterinary practice. Alleviating pain in our patients, whether it be acute pain from an injury, chronic pain from an illness or anticipated pain from a procedure or an exam that we're going to do. When we alleviate that, it leads to improved patient outcomes and it enhances the quality of life for the pet as well as for mm -hmm. the veterinary client patient relationship. Our focus has really shifted towards making the patient more comfortable and less stressed overall. We've gained insight into the key relationship between pain and stress in our patients and how that ultimately affects the bond we see between pets and their owners. A stronger bond tends to lead to increased responsible ownership practices, and that's what we all want to see. Not only are owners more committed to providing routine health care, but they're also more in tune to recognize those subtle changes in their pet's health. And they're more likely to contact us and seek out our advice. We see that animals are living longer and pet owners want them to have fulfilled and stress-free and comfortable lives, just like they want for themselves. It's vital for us in the veterinary industry to take a step back and look at our patients' lives, both inside and outside of the veterinary clinic. Our role as veterinary professionals in the human-animal bond is to truly maximize the potential of this relationship between people and animals. So how can we do that? How do we take that step back and really examine a pet's life more holistically looking for ways that they may be encountering stress that perhaps their owners are not aware of. For starters, we look at the types of stressors that they encounter both at their home, but also within our care. We talk about the effect that those stressors can have on the, not only their health, but on the bond that they have with their owner. And then what can we do to help lower that stress and thereby help maintain that human animal bond. So at this point, I am gonna ask that you take out your cell phone and I know we all have it near and dear to us, um, but I do want this to be a little interactive in the next few slides. So I'll ask you to go ahead and take your cell phone out and there's gonna be a QR code on your screen. Go ahead and scan that QR code and it's gonna take you to slido.com where you're gonna join some interactive sessions with us.
I'm going to give everybody just a couple of seconds to go ahead and scan that QR code. So I want to know from all of you attending, what sources of stress do you feel that patients are facing at home? What can you identify when you're thinking of your patients? What are those stress points that they see at home? So as you're responding, you're gonna see them pop up on the screen and we're gonna see the answers that are most popular are gonna get bigger on the screen. Um, I love Slido because it kind of gives us that idea of what, what people are indicating. So lots of people saying separation from owners, separation anxiety, kids. <laughs> I am a, a parent of three. Um, so I, I understand the stress that kids have on pets and on parents. Um, loud noises, other pets. Um, love this. Teeth brushing, visitors, neighbors, multi-dog homes, emotions of people, um, small children. Lots of great answers, guys. This is fantastic. So these are great. So yeah, we see that our patients face so many sources of stress within the home, not enough exercise. I love that answer. Stranger danger, medication administration. These are great. We're going to switch gears now and we're going to look at what do you identify as those sources of stress for when they're before they're coming to the vet office. So before they actually enter your facility, but as they're coming in. So again, what sources of stress are patients encountering before they even get to your office that we need to be more aware of and be educating our pet owners on so that they can keep that bond that they've worked so hard to create. Car ride, car ride, car ride, absolutely love it. Carrier, seeing the carrier, prior experience, a lot of the same things coming up, traffic. Traffic is stressful for everybody. Um, new scenery, loud noises, the parking lot, love all of these things, scheduling the appointment, <laughs> I love that, the owner's anxiety, change of smell, these are all fantastic answers, you guys are so right on it. Okay, last question, what are those sources of stress once they get to you? So looking at your patients now, what source of stress are they facing once they enter your office? Smells, great one. Prior experience, absolutely. Cats, radiographs, other dogs, pets in lobby. Yep, you guys have all of it down. Love that. Waiting area, owners. So I'm seeing a theme in all of our answers. You guys have have hit the nail on the head too. Owner's anxiety leads to stress in our pets. So this is great because we're going to talk more about this. Fantastic. So lots of things about the scale, about handling, just about the environment in general. Um, smells definitely is the number one. Slippery floors. Um, fantastic. I love all these answers. All right. So it's often easy for us to identify those sources of stress for our patients. And just like you guys pointed out on those slides, there's some that really impact patients coming into our office, right? I think everybody mentioned noise, right? It's easily encountered in our veterinary setting. Those unfamiliar, excessive noises. Have you ever sat back in a veterinary or any sort of pet space and really listen to the noises that are around. Um, a lot of times we become sort of blind to those noises. I remember when I worked in the ER setting and working in the ICU overnights and the pumps would be going off, the fluid pumps would constantly be going off. You would hear it in your sleep when you went home. But when you were there, it became background noise and you didn't hear it anymore. We often don't hear the noises that our patients hear but these are noises that are very strange to them. Even the noise of a phone ringing repeatedly or overhead paging, these can all be sources of stress for our patients. Isolation and separation. I mentioned this because this can be stressful for our pets 
It can be related to separation from housemates. If they're very bonded to another pet in their home and they're now taken to the veterinary office or even groomers um, or daycare and boarding, those type of spaces where they're away from that housemate that they are so bonded to, whether it be another animal or perhaps their caregiver, that human bond, when they're separated, that creates stress. And that's why part of what we educate on in Fear Free is encouraging veterinary professionals and pet professionals to really keep pets with their owners as much as possible. Overcrowding, we can see as a source of stress. Lack of food. This is one that's often overlooked, especially in the veterinary setting. This is important for those patients that come in and spend several hours with us. Think of those drop-off appointments or patients that have to stay for a procedure. Um, if they aren't able to access food, that can be a source of stress for them. So if it's possible to offer them something, obviously taking into account medical contraindications and why they're there, if they're being anesthetized or sedated, we have to take that into consideration. But if they're a drop-off appointment and they're able to get some food, just knowing that they have it available to them can a lot of times reduce that stress level. Lack of water, that's another one that we often overlook. We, at Fear Free, we encourage our veterinary and pet professionals to make sure that pets have access to food and access to water. Again, taking into consideration why they're there, but doing that even during exam or wellness visits, putting out a bowl of water can reduce stress for so many patients. You guys all commented on unfamiliar surroundings. That's a given, right? A pet visits the veterinary setting. They may not be familiar with what they're walking into. That stress can really damage the human animal bond between the pet and the pet owner, because a lot of times they associate their owner with those unfamiliar surroundings and the memories that are created within them. Conflict with other animals. This can be a brief encounter in the waiting area, or it can be no real nose to nose or face to face encounter. It could just be visualization of a predator species. And that can lead to fear responses, which can then damage that human animal bond. Imagine being a gecko or one of my chickens taken to a veterinary office by your caretaker who you trust and are bonded to. And inadvertently during that, you're exposed to a predator species. And you may not now remain as bonded to that caregiver because you may associate them with that exposure. So identifying that as a potential source of stress and then educating our clients on that is important. Transport, we nailed that one. It's most common, most easily identified source of stress for our patients. They have to get to us somehow and they have to be transported to do that. And that comes with a lot of sources of stress. This one is one that our friends at Covetris personalized care pharmacies can assist us with. And that's what's so great. As veterinary professionals, it's important for us to identify these sources of stress ahead of time and advocate for our patients. We went into this to be the voice of those that can't speak. We wanna advocate for what will make their experience better. We should be proactively recommending pre-visit medications that can help reduce anxiety associated with transport as well as motion sickness. I encourage veterinary professionals to speak to the team at Covetra's Personalized Care Pharmacy and discuss what's available to reduce stress in that area. Mm -hmm. Smells was one that came up on every slide, you guys. You guys all put smells as a source of stress, which is great. Fear-free education helps us evaluate not only what patients see when they enter our facility, but also the olfactory stimulation they encounter. Just like with noise, too often we become blind to these things. And many times we create an atmosphere that is pleasing to us, but may not be pleasing to our patients. It's important to remember those things. Strangers, visitors, and handling. We all realize this is a constant source of stress for our patients, both within our care, but also in their home environment. I know my dog is a very well socialized dog, despite being a pandemic puppy. Um, but when someone new comes to the house, that is stressful for him. So knowing that, advocating for patients, working with 
pet owners to advocate for pharmaceuticals that can help reduce stress associated with this trigger can help increase that human animal bond for our pet owners. It's another great opportunity to talk to Covetra's personalized care pharmacy about this. And one thing that I noted that you guys brought up on all the slides was owner stress. That's such a key thing to be honed in on. There's numerous published articles and studies outlining the health benefits of pet ownership, which include things like less anxiety over time, less depression, lower blood pressure, and increased physical activity. There's fewer publications looking at the correlation between pet ownership and anxiety as it relates to the responsibilities of owning a pet. The pandemic exposed that many pet owners are actually anxious about leaving their pet alone for extended periods of time. They're anxious about finding appropriate and adequate veterinary care. And then they're stressed about how to pay for that veterinary care. They worry about how to handle chronic illness with their pets. And the fact that the length of their pet's lifespan compared to their own is shorter. There's lots of factors that are affecting our pet owners that are causing stress, which then affect the pets. And this ultimately damages that bond that they have. Studies have shown that social animals, when they're exposed to the same stressors, they can actually be affected similarly. And stress has been shown to actually be contagious within, indivi within individuals of the same species. So think of that the next time you're stressed out and around your friends or vice versa. So how does this relate to our patients? We know that our patients and humans share the same living quarters many times. And so they're often exposed to similar sources of stress. A study from Sweden in 2019 actually looked at hair cortisol concentrations between dogs and humans sharing the same living conditions. And the study actually found that the dogs mirrored their human counterparts when it came to their level of cortisol secretion based on stressful events. So what does that mean to us as veterinary professionals and pet professionals? It means that if we can help pet owners feel less stressed about certain aspects of their pet's lives, we can then in turn reduce our patient's level of stress and anxiety. And ultimately that's what we're about at Fear Free. So how do we collaborate with our pet owners? It starts with education. Educating our owners doesn't stop with simply providing information on the best preventive care or ensuring that they understand the disease process that their pet is facing. Education includes providing information to owners on how to identify and alleviate stress, as well as educating them on alternatives to treatment, to treatments that are commercially available, such as compound adoptions. Pet owners don't want to see their family members stressed, and they certainly don't want to be the source of stress for them. By showing empathy and understanding, we can open up the channels of communication to educate our pet owners in this area. It's our job as veterinary and pet professionals to identify risk factors for disease, as well as stress and emotional harm. By listening to all aspects of a pet's life experience and really getting that holistic approach to their history and their home care and asking those more in-depth questions, we can help owners identify potential sources of stress for pets before they lead to medical concerns. Our job also includes promoting the best options for our pets, which may include thinking outside the box for treatment options. Collaborating with owners means being aware of those points of stress that both the owners and the pets are facing at home, during transport to, and upon entry to the facility. We need to help owners create success ahead of time by creating positive associations at home. Educating clients on how to lower stress in everyday situations at home with their pets. 
I'm going to touch on just a couple of these points of stress that we are often forgotten about when we're managing medical illness for our patients, but can negatively impact the human animal bond between our patients and, our, and their owners. And I'll say I was in practice for a number of years before I joined the Fear Free team. And these are points of stress that I didn't necessarily think about when I was talking to owners about disease processes, about talking about what's best for their pet, making recommendations. These are things that have come to my attention through education and knowledge over time. But now, as Dr. Becker always likes to say, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once I've identified these sources of stress, they're things that I feel very passionate about that we need to be talking to owners more and more about. And we have great ways of intervening now to help reduce those points of stress for them. So for pets with chronic illnesses that require daily medication, administration of that medication can actually be a source of stress, not just for the pet, but for the owner as well. Some statistics report that owner compliance of oral medication at home is actually less than 30%, you guys. That means that most pets, the vast majority of them are not receiving needed therapy prescribed by veterinarians. There's a number of factors that influence owner compliance things like the cost and the accessibility of the medication, the number of medications needed, the frequency and duration of the medications, how complex is it to give them? And do those at home contain the ability to give the medications to the pet? I'll be honest, these aren't always questions that I asked. When I was prescribing medications, oftentimes it was a, here's your medication and this is how it has to be given. But I don't know that I necessarily took the time to always ask these questions about, you know, are you worried about this? Are you okay giving this medication? How can I make this a better experience for you? It's important that we start asking pet owners if they feel comfortable administering medication, if they're knowledgeable in how to do so, especially in a fear-free manner and advising them on ways that will help limit patient stress when they're giving medication. A 2022 study from the International Society for Feline Medicine of 2,500 participants noted that about half of the cat owners were sometimes or never provided with information or advice on how to administer medication. So half of them were left to figure it out on their own. Those that were given information found it very useful. And about half of those who did not receive information actually went to the internet to try to figure out how to administer medications to their pet. Those that were giving medication to their cat most responded that it changed their relationship with their pet. Three quarters of them reported that their cat tried to bite or scratch them during medication administration, three quarters. Imagine the change in that bond between the cat and that owner. Other challenges included the cat spitting out the medication, refusing it because it was given in food or running away completely. And a third of the owners admitted to not completing the course of medication. Not only is this a fail for us in treating the patient, but it irreversibly changes that human animal bond between the owner and the pet. And it creates fear memories that will ultimately affect the emotional well being of the pet. It's really helpful to start rethinking chronic medication administration. Compounding pharmacies are a great resource for pet owners when they struggle with compliance because it's stressful or it's difficult to medicate their pet. Often we, and I say we because I was in this group, we think of compounding only when we're unable to obtain a medication or maybe the dose we need is outside of what's currently available. It's important that we change the way we think about it and it should be our first choice when considering medication administration. Covetra's personalized care pharmacies offers pet friendly dose forms that are easy to prescribe, they're easy to give and they're easy to keep giving. When I was in practice, one of the biggest struggles I ran into, and one that that previous study reinforced, was giving medications to cats. Even my own cats, I have two, and they're difficult to medicate. 
and I'm a veterinarian. What if instead of dreading that experience, one that I know my cat hated, and I didn't really like that much either, what if I could choose a product? Um, so for example, choosing mini melts that can deliver medication to my pet in a form that dissolves rapidly once it's inside their mouth. Great, right? I don't have to worry about struggling with them to try to put a pill down their throat and they're just gonna get mad and you know they're foaming at the mouth and their saliva going everywhere and that's not in a time that anybody wants to be enjoying. Perhaps as a veterinarian, I can consult with one of the veterinary exclusive pharmacists that could help me determine if the medication I want to administer works in that form. Maybe they can help me choose the best option and deliver a medication to my patient that's more well-received by both the patient and the owner. Compounding of medication should no longer be reserved to be used when needed. It really should be our first choice because we wanna create patient-tailored approaches to treatment that helps reduce stress and preserves the human-animal bond. When we're having discussions with pet owners about the method of delivery of medication that will work best for them, we also need to discuss how they go about delivering that medication, not just the form the medication is in, but how they set up that experience. We all have known those clients or even colleagues who have to chase down a pet to give it medication. In fact, I recently watched a friend of mine struggle to administer oral medication to her horse who was suffering from founder. Now, this is a sweet 19-year-old horse. She wasn't bad. She wasn't really bad for the medication administration, but it wasn't going as well as it could have been because the owner had not really been given the education and the tools to make it a stress-free experience. Luckily, we're going to provide a link in the chat to some really great educational videos on how to administer medication in a fear-free manner. These videos were created by the Covetris Personalized Care Pharmacy team in collaboration with Ingrid Johnson, who's a fear-free certified professional and a certified cat behaviorist. The great thing about these videos is you can share them with pet owners as a source of education. You can make sure that the daily care of a pet with a chronic medication can be positive so that we're preserving that human animal bond that they've worked so hard to create. In addition to that link, Fear Free provides a number of handouts on educating pet owners on how to give oral medications in a fear-free manner. We also provide videos online on how to administer topical medications, eye medication and ear medication in a manner that helps reduce fear, anxiety, and stress. I recently had an ear infection and I can say that administration of ear medications is stressful, not just to pets, but to people too. Um, and these are just things that you realize that you may not have thought about before. And so it's all about that approach that we're creating. So beyond just the formulation of the medication, but is, it, but is educating those clients on how to make the whole experience less stressful. Nutrition what to feed a pet. It's a hot topic and we're just gonna skim over it. It's one that evokes lots of emotions, but for pet owners, we see emotions like hesitation, frustration, anxiety, and suspicion. Those emotions can impact the choice they make in what to feed their pet. Ultimately, we wanna make sure that we're guiding them to provide really good nutrition. But beyond just the type of food chosen, the act of feeding can also be a source of stress for pets, especially those with chronic illnesses when meals are utilized to deliver medication. As we noted in the feline study, many pets, particularly cats, become food aversive due to owners attempting to utilize food to deliver medication. This food aversion can lead to a source of stress for pets and owners when they're trying to provide food for their pet and it becomes a stressful situation or their pet suddenly is not eating because of something that occurred, that is very stressful, causes anxiety. Pet owners feel like they're not doing what's best for their pet. We wanna help educate them and we wanna make sure that we're providing alternatives to using that food as a source of medication administration. We also need to think about the actual meal time itself, can that be stressful? 
Maybe it's due to social dynamics within the home. Maybe it's the type of food selected. Maybe it's the place where the pet eats or the human pet interactions surrounding that feeding time. There's lots of areas where stress can creep in, in something that should be pretty routine. For some pets, there may be medical issues leading to stress surrounding mealtimes, such as food intolerance, dental issues, pain. It's important to remember that eating is a normal physiological requirement. And if we have periods of anorexia, we should go looking for a medical condition first, but we should also keep in the back of our head that there could be a stress related factor to this. Anxiety can develop if other pets within the home are challenging them for who gets to eat first. Perhaps one pet bullies the other for food. I see this at the barn I work at where we have a couple of minis and a pony and a paddock and there's definitely some bullying and some stress associated with eating for all three of those horses. Especially for cats, mealtime in nature requires hunting and gathering. So when they're being offered food in a bowl, this can lead to boredom which can be a source of stress and anxiety in our patients. It's important for us to take that extra time to educate owners on the environmental changes that they can make to help reduce mealtime stress. Taking that step back, looking at the environment holistically as it relates to mealtimes, asking the questions, where are the food dishes located? What does mealtime look like in your house for your pets? Is the environment in which the food is placed quiet and relaxing? Does the pet have the opportunity to eat without being bothered? And for pets with chronic illnesses, we wanna make attempts to separate medication administration from mealtimes to reduce that chance of food aversion. Discuss the options for compounding of medications so that the food does not have to be the method of delivery and ensure that pet owners are allowing time between mealtime and medication time so that they don't um, associate the two together. One of the big things we've experienced since the pandemic is the effect that a change in routine and time spent with pets has on their emotional well being. A 2020 study from the Royal Veterinary College found that 41% of pet owners noted behavioral changes in their pets during the pandemic, particularly dogs. Most of our companion animals seek routine and attention from their owners. I know my dog does, he wakes up at 5 30 every day regardless of whether it's a weekend or not, because that is his routine and we are to go outside then. If we change that, he becomes stressed. Education on consistency and routines, on providing enrichment options for pets when they're left alone, and consulting veterinarians for pharmaceutical interventions when needed can help reduce that long lasting effect of stress on our pets. And it helps protect that human animal bond that they've already established. By taking that whole pet approach with our patients, we can really work to preserve and defend the human animal bond that our clients have developed with their pets. And that truthfully has been evolving, as we said, for over 15,000 years. It's important to help pet owners identify the potential sources of stress within their own homes and work with us to help lower these stresses. As veterinary professionals, we can work alongside partners such as Covetra's personalized care pharmacies to help provide options to our clients to maintain a strong human animal bond and lower patient stress. I wanna thank you guys for joining me tonight. I know we have some time now for some questions and I'm gonna go back to Stacy. I think you've been monitoring things and see what we've got. Thank you so much, Dr. Marlo. Thank you for taking the time to review the human animal bond, what it's made up of, and how we can be more cognizant as professionals with preparing our pet owners and our patients to address those causes of fear, anxiety, and stress and improve their overall experience. We do have a few questions from tonight's audience for any of you who are still waiting to type in questions. Uh, please do that in the question and answer box. Jen, I know that we did the Slido mm -hmm. and we came up with a lot of ideas about very common stressors in the veterinary office. If you had to pick your top, your top few stressors that you see with patients that are coming into the vet, what would you point out? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think the number one that I see is inadvertent conflict with other animals, um, especially in the last few years when potentially our pets have not been as well socialized. Um, preparing owners that there's going to be other pets in the, the building or really taking a look at your schedule, taking a look at how the workflow is set up um, and analyzing where patients may come into contact that may cause stress um, is a really big step to reducing that anxiety for patients and for pet owners. Um, I think pet owners are always concerned of how their pet is going to behave around another animal. So I think that's really important. Um, and then, I truly believe that noises and smells, because we become so blind to them that we tune them out, are big sources of stress for patients that we sometimes don't remember or don't think about because they're not affecting us. And we tend not to think of them as sources of stress if they're not causing us stress. So those would be the big ones. That's a great answer. And you know what really comes to my mind when you say that is the car and how loud the radio is in the car. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I'm in the car by myself and I got those Bose speakers, <laughs> I got that cranked up um, and I'm jamming out. But when I have my dog in the car with me, I'm definitely very cognizant of keeping that volume low, switching to calming music. And I don't know that it's something that a lot of pet parents really think about because we're so used to, you know, playing loud music when we're driving. So that's, well, that one always comes to mind. Mm -hmm. I see uh Donna chiming in in the chat with how cats are transported in the carrier, mm -hmm. swinging back and forth. Definitely yeah. something that can be stressful. Uh, a couple of times you mentioned your presentation, how stressors occurring over time can begin to interfere with the human animal bond. Do you think there's a threshold for this or would you say it's kind of more individual for each pet and it's going to be variable about how many stressors they experience when it begins to impact that bond with their pet parent? Yeah, I think it is very individualized. I think we know that stress over time, right? I mean, so so everything is, we're always exposed to stress, right? Most of us can bounce back and we don't have long lasting effects. And, and that's the same for many of our pets as well. Acute stress, um, they can generally bounce back. It's when we have stress over time or we're stacking sources of stress. Um, so stressful car ride. Now we have an inadvertent patient, you know, patient to patient interaction in the lobby, and maybe there's some barking in the background. Now we've got stacking of stressors. The more stressors we have are going to change actually the neuron pathways in the brain and create scarring. And that's going to lead to fear. And that's when we're going to get that effect on the human animal bond, because we actually get changes within their brain. Um, we don't know how many times a pet has to encounter stress to create that fear scar, but we do know it happens. Each pet is going to be different. Uh, everyone knows their own pets best. Um, you know, when your pet is becoming more and more stressed. Um, but I do know that those, when we get all that stacking mm -hmm. on top of each other, we're more likely to get those fear responses, those long-term scars to the brain that are going to really ultimately affect that human animal bond. And that's why I think this sort of holistic approach and identifying those different sources of stress, if we can eliminate one or two, three of them um, along the way, that's less stacking of stressors, less likely to lead to that fear response and that long-term scar. Thanks so much for clarifying on that. We've had a couple requests for you to show the slide again that has the link to Fear Free Happy Homes as well to the link with the Covetra's Personalized Care Pharmacy. I know we've dropped those links in the chat, but if you wouldn't mind scrolling back to that slide. And then we also had another question about recommended resources for home enriching ideas to refer to owners. So could you share a couple thoughts on Fear Free Happy Homes and what's accessible there in terms of enrichment? For sure. So I love Fear Free Happy Homes. So um, we all know our, our clients are going to go to the internet and search for things, right? And Fear Free Happy Homes provides something that we know is scientifically backed. Um, it's been reviewed by behaviorists. They support what we have on there. 
we provide lots of great information for pet owners on ways to reduce stress, enrichment options at home, enrichment options for transport. Um, there's enrichment options for pets that are confined or on cage rest. There's great material there that we have reviewed and is scientifically backed. So you know it's accurate and it's not just coming from Dr. Google, um, which is great. So I encourage and utilize Fear Free Happy Homes. When I was in practice, that was my go-to for client education that um, would help them prepare their pets for vet visits, prepare their home. Um, we can. There's great handouts on what to do when you get your pet back home from the vet, like how to make that introduction back home less stressful for your pet that's coming home, but also for the pets that were left behind um, and now have someone coming back who maybe smells differently or had some things done to them. Um, lots of great resources there. Again, a great resource on how to give medications in a fear-free way, um, which I think is so important and something that I wish I knew more about when I was in practice so that I could educate owners better about. Looks like we got one in the chat if they can give those resources freely to our clients and fear free happy homes is publicly accessible to anyone so fear free to feel free to share out the link share it on your socials, you can link it on your website, you can link it in the emails that go out to your pet parents before they come into your practice. Um, it's a great uh, freely accessible resource for you to share with your clients. I love this question that just came in from Amy. If the human animal bond has been damaged by the administration of chronic medications over time, how do we help pet owners to start to repair this bond when we still need to be giving that medication? Yeah, so I, I love that. And I think it's all about creating positive associations. So we can repair it. Um, we know that, right? We know that positivity outweighs negativity um, and we can undo those, those changes by creating those positive associations. And maybe it's the first step of looking at what formulation is that medication in? How are we giving it to them? What can we change there as a first step to make it a more pleasant experience so that we're not um, having to um, force a medication or we're not fighting with a patient to take something because if we start there and it becomes a pleasant experience right there and right there, then we can build off of that. And then creating those positive experiences, playing classical music when they have to get their medication, making sure that they're on a non-slip surface, making sure that we give positive distractors, um, that are in line with that medication. Some need to be given with food, some need to wait for food. So we have to make sure that we're not going to um, interact with the medication at all, but maybe we look at other positive reinforcers. Does the pet like to be brushed? Does the pet like to be petted? Does the pet like to play with a tennis ball? Like what else can we do during that time um, to make that a more positive experience? And little by little, by increasing those positive associations, we can undo that damage to the human animal bond and restore what that client had with that pet to begin with. Incredible. I saw that this question was uh, just answered in the chat, but I do want to bring it, uh, bring this awareness to everybody who may not have seen this. Um, but Ivy wrote in that they use pre-visit pharmaceuticals for their pet parents to give prior to the vet visit. And they mentioned that sometimes the pet owners report that they can't give the meds prior to the visit. So they were wondering if we could review the slide that has the different form dose forms, which is already on there. And they asked if gabapentin is available in a transdermal. And uh, our friends at Covetra's Personalized Care Pharmacies were able to share that the great thing about personalized care pharmacies is you call and consult with a pharmacist to figure out the best solution for that specific pet. So while there is gabapentin in a transdermal, there are also so many other options available and their pharmacists are available to consult with you for every specific case. So a great resource to have there. Just wanted to bring some attention to that in case anybody had missed it in the Q&A box. And it looks like we probably have time for one more question here. Uh, let me see. Okay. So there's been a few people have chimed in about how to start helping owners to recognize their pet stress. 
how to start that conversation and, and help them see maybe some signs that they're missing and understand, you know, how to read that body language and, and how to really understand what their pet is experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. So I love our um, FAS scale diagrams. And, and for those who are not as familiar, FAS is our acronym that stands for fear, anxiety, and stress. Um, and we have great um, uh, documents and handouts and flyers and posters that show the different levels of FAS in patients and the body language that will be shown. Um, and I used to have these up on the exam room walls in my clinic so that as I was talking to clients, I could show them what I'm seeing and show them on the diagram where their pet matches up. So maybe their pet is um, hiding behind the chair. Um, that's a common one. And um, the owner will be like, oh, he's just nervous. And yes, he is nervous. You're right. But I can now show you on our chart that he's like a level two or three out of five. And his stress level is higher than they may have anticipated or expected. What they may see as him being, you know, maybe quote unquote difficult or nervous is actually really high anxiety and stress in him. So I think it's starting to show those signs and really talking to them and removing that idea that their pet is quote unquote bad or that they have done something or missed something, but truly educating them. Um, I know I used to joke when pets would yawn in the exam room and before I knew that it was a sign of stress, I would be like, oh, we're boring fluffy. Now, when I know it's a sign of stress, I can say, ooh, you know what? Fluffy's showing me that he's stressed right now. How is he showing me that? He's yawning and why is that? And we can have that discussion and that you know, conversation about what that means. Most pet owners want that information. They want to learn about their pets and they just don't know. So picking up on those little cues, using our FAS scales to look at your patients and then look at the scale and see what type of body language they're showing. And then having just an open discussion with clients without any judgment can really help bridge that gap and start educating them. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we also have another comment here. I just want to bring to everyone's attention for anybody visiting the Covetris Personalized Care Pharmacy link to try to access those videos, be sure to scroll down to the bottom of the page. Um, pet owners love these videos, but if you are clicking on that link and not seeing them, please be sure to scroll all the way down to the bottom uh, so that way you'll be able to access those videos. And I want to say thank you again to Dr. Merlo. Thank you to our friends at Covetris Personalized Care Pharmacies for making tonight's presentation possible. And most importantly, I want to thank every one of you for your dedication to preventing and alleviating fear, anxiety, and stress and attending our lecture late in the evening uh, here. And so we appreciate all of you so much. And thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you on our next webinar. Have a great evening, everyone. Hi, everybody.